Happy Sabbath. We'd like to welcome you to Turning Point Mission Center Church. I'm Pastor Arnett Owen, and we just thank you for joining us for our service today. We have a very blessed and exciting, powerful message. And please, stay tuned. You will be blessed. Uh, this message is brought to us by our Senior Pastor, Elder Micah F. Owen. God bless you all. Thank you for joining us. And know that God loves you with an everlasting love. And you know what? You can do nothing about it. They, nothing can separate us from God's love. So enjoy God's love and be blessed as the word go forth. Thank you for joining us. God your waiting people we are ready Lord for a blessing from on high let your word flow in this place today in Jesus name we pray and we thank you Father Amen in the book of Romans chapter 12 verse 2 we find that the word of God says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Just for a few moments today, we're going to be speaking on the topic, Imagine Me. I've been changed. Imagine me. I've been changed. Can you imagine hating Christians so much that the goal of your life is to put an end to their movement and their existence? Breathing murderous threats. You set off with the appropriate letters of approval and you travel far and near to arrest anyone belonging to this dangerous movement. Back in the days of Paul, Christians were considered to be dangerous. They were considered dangerous because they were proclaiming a radical message and starting a radical movement that was shaking up the very foundations of the traditional in their time. I wonder if today we are considered to be dangerous or if we are considered to be passive and ineffective. Christians in those days were very active and mobile and they stood up for what they believed even to the point of being persecuted hunted down many of them even killed because they were bold enough to stand up for the gospel of Jesus Christ what Paul taught was so radical that even today the followers of Jesus still strive for understanding for there are some things that Paul wrote that are even difficult for us to really grasp a full understanding even now and only by the teaching of the Holy Spirit can we come into full knowledge and full understanding of many of the things that he wrote but during this time you come face to face with the resurrected res resurrected resurrected Lord Jesus, and the course of your life takes on a dramatic change. Preaching the same faith you once tried to destroy, your life's accounts become epic stories of faith. Your letters are widely read and your insights become the topic of debate for centuries and centuries to come. The Apostle Paul was the man responsible for spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ to the far reaches of the known world. What he taught was so radical that even today, the followers of Jesus still strive to understand. 
you know, we have watered down the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've watered it down, and we try to blend it in with what everybody else is teaching and what everybody else is proclaiming. And we have a different message that God has given us. We have a radical message. We have a message that goes against the grain, but so oftentimes we take out the plane and we try to smooth it down and, and cover it in such a way that it's more palatable for those that we are trying to uh, witness to. But at the same time, they need that two-edged sword we hide the sword and we give them instead feel-good things that make them feel good about themselves and make them feel good about you and, and, and about others. But God has given us a hard message, and he's given us a radical message for this world today. The book of Romans is masterfully written, and it's an exposition on God's grace and the righteousness that comes by grace through faith. This book or this letter uh, that we find here in Romans is the foundation for the entire Christian faith. It was so radical that the apostle Paul explains this gospel was received by direct revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ. You can find that over in Galatians 1 verses 11 and 12. The truth contained in this letter in the book of Romans had the power to transform a murderous Pharisee into the man we now know as the Apostle Paul. It has greatly influenced men like Augustine and Martin Luther and John Wesley. And most profoundly, it has greatly affected even my life as well. Romans 12 verse 2 says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, that word transform literally means to metamorph. In other words, it means to change from one form into another. Christ's appearance is one example of what that metamorph looks like when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration. And uh, the Bible lets us know that he had his disciples there with him. And he said, you all wait here, I'm gonna go a little farther. And he, uh, he went on and uh, he began to pray and and, and they were awakened out of their sleep, isn't it? It, it? It's always amazing how the people of God have trouble staying awake, uh, especially when it comes to serving God. Amen. We have trouble. We can stay awake for anything else. But that sleep demon will come and he'll put us to sleep. Uh, when we're in the house of prayer, when we are out uh, and supposed to be doing the work of the Lord, we choose to sleep rather than to work. And, 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 and the disciples were asleep, but... Uh, it was something that woke them up. I, I believe it was the magnified and glorified presence of God. And, and, and they looked around and they beheld Jesus Christ in his transfigured or his transformed glory. And, and the Bible goes on to say that his appearance had changed and he no longer looked like the ordinary man that they had walked through with for almost three years now, but he, he had a brightness about himself and, 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 and there was a glow upon him and his countenance was changed. And, 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 and if you notice, whenever uh, the glory of the Lord comes upon an individual, something changes about them and, and, and they begin to look and appear and, and to even conduct themselves in such a way that is not like they normally do. How can you come into the presence of God and still be the same way? Amen. But too often we see people doing that very thing. There are other occurrences in the Bible where we find this word transform that we find in Romans 12, verse 2. We find it in other places in the Bible as well. 
uh, Matthew 17, 2, the, the Bible says, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine, talking about Jesus. Uh, when he was transfigured, when he was transformed, his face began to shine. And, 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 and it shone like the sun, and this was at night. This was in the darkest moments of nighttime, but yet he was shining bright like the sun, and, and his raiment was white as the light. In Mark chapter 9, verse 2, the Bible says, And after six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John and leadeth them up into an high mountain apart from themselves, and he was transfigured before them. Had Peter, James, and John, he had witnesses. And you know something? If you have been transformed, if you have gone to a transformation in your life, if you have metamorphosed from that character and that being that you used to be into a brand new creature, there's going to be some witnesses that can testify to your change. And if can't nobody say that, you know, I, I remember when he was like this, but now he's like this, or I remember when she was like this, or, but now she's like, if there are no witnesses, there's something wrong with your transformation. Somebody's going to notice that it's something different about you. Now, just like we can transform and metamorphose into something good, we can also metamorph into something that is not good. Oh, you remember Lucifer when he was up in heaven. Do you re recognize that he was the most decorated angel that God had created? And the word even says that he was created perfectly. But then he metamorphed. He transformed. And he transformed from a creature of righteousness into the father of all lies. You see, we can metamorph or we can transform and go either way. It depends on your heart and your connection to glory to glory even as by the spirit of the lord we are changed in the same image into the same image changed into the same image of our lord and thank god it is by grace that we can transform into the glory of god God wants us to not only be with him, he wants us to be like him. He wants us to de develop characteristics like him. He wants us to be transformed in our hearts and our minds so that we can be more like him. Man, fallen man may be transformed by the renewing of the mind so that he can prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How does he prove this? By the Holy Spirit taking possession of his mind, his spirit, his heart, and his character. You see, the garbage of questionable principles and practices is to be swept away out of our lives. Questionable things. Things that are in the gray area. We got too much gray area stuff going on all around us and even in our lives. Uh, it, we, 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 we begin to uh, fashion our lives around those things that are questionable. And, and it could be right, but it might be wrong. You, you, you see what I'm saying? In, in other words, those gray areas, those questionable areas. And, and, and then, lo and behold, we neglect what thus said the Lord, and we began to gravitate towards those things are, that are questionable. And I know people that specialize in questionable characters, questionable dispositions. And they're not quite wrong, but they're not quite right. And you'll find people like that, they are not quite sad, but they're not quite happy. And you know something, I dare say that I, I don't want the Lord to say, well, you're not quite saved and you're not quite lost. There's no such thing. 
you're going to either be saved or you're going to be lost. You're going to either be on the Lord's side or you're going to be on the devil's side. You're going to either stand up for right or you're going to stand up for wrong. There's no in-between. And we got to get out of this in-between message that we have began to filter out into the people of God. It's time to call sin, sin. It's time to call holiness, holiness. It's time for us to stop trying to sugarcoat stuff and see people headed to hell and try to make them feel like they're headed to heaven. And we've got to go through a transformation See, when those little caterpillars metaphors into butterflies, it's a complete change. You don't see half of the caterpillar hanging on to the butterfly wings. If you see something like that, you will run from it because you realize that this is something wrong with that, and you even say it's deformed. But look in your mirror. When I say your mirror, I'm saying my mirror too. Look in your mirror. What do you see? Do you see somebody that started to transform? But somewhere in the process, the transformation was not complete. That's why you got so many winds of doctrines. That's why you got so many confused folk today. Because they started out in the right direction, but somewhere along the way. Instead of continuing with the Lord, they shook hands with the devil. The Lord desires the mind to be renovated. You know, and in, 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 in renovations, uh, I notice that they go in and they do an evaluation. This got to come out. This got to come out. We got to change this. Uh, that might be able to stay, but we got to do something to it to, to refresh it and renovate it. That's, that's what people that do renovations do. They go in and they don't just do it on the surface. Uh, am I telling the truth, Deacon? They, they don't just do it on the if Now, some folk will do it on the surface because they're just trying to make a quick buck or do a quick project. They don't care what you got to deal with once you get that. But a, a, someone that is truly determined to do a good renovation, they'll go in and they'll go all in the walls and they'll inspect all of that. They'll even check the foundation and all of the plumbing and the electrical and everything. Those things that don't necessarily meet the eye, but they'll lie under the surface. And see what God's folk have fallen into is that we will renovate, but we'll do it on the outside. Uh, we renovate how we dress and what what type of clothes we wear and and what our hairstyle or or lack of hairstyle may be. You know, we we we'll make all of those kinds of changes. But God is standing by, t looking at us, and He's looking at the plumbing of our life, our char character, our hearts, and He He's wondering when you're gonna allow me to come in and fix all of that mess that's inside of you. We come and we sit comfortably in the sanctuary and don't have to worry about sweating because the air is on and don't have to worry about being cold because the heat is on and, and all of that. And we come into this place and we feel like we have served the Lord. There's no service here. There's no service here. Turn to somebody and say, there's no service here. There's no service here. The service is outside those doors. The service is out there in the streets. The service is in the neighborhood, in, in the communities, in our city, in our state, in, in this nation. That's where our service is. 
That's what a service is. But instead of us getting the pureness of the food and the bread of life, we have started eating garbage. Then we come to the church and we say, well, you know, mm, I, I, I just don't like going to church because it's boring. I know all of y'all have heard somebody say that. I, I don't go to church because Pastor Owen, he just, he, he don't make me feel good. And we go to places where we want to be inter, what, what's the rest of that word? Inter what? Entertained. You see, we are living in a society that loves entertainment. Well, they, they've even come up with ways now, Joshua, that you can just entertain yourself. You, you get a cell phone and you turn on this game or that video and all that. And some people stay up all night long entertaining themselves. And then they come to the church, baby sister, and they expect to be entertained at the church. I'm going to tell you right now, I can't compete with no entertainers. I'm going to tell you, no, God didn't make me an entertainer. He made me a watchman. He made me one to stand on the wall to proclaim that the enemy is coming and the people of God are under attack. No, I'm not an entertainer, and I'm not going to moonwalk all over this stage up here, and I, I'm not going to try to make you feel good and, and all of that. I'm going to tell you what Jesus said. I'm not confused about this thing. We find ourselves going seeking things that soothe our ears. Uh, yeah, I... I, I, I'm living in sin, but I want somebody just to remind me that, that you know, I, I can come like I am, and I can stay like I am, and I can still be in God's favor. I ain't going to lie to you. The wages of sin is still death. And a lot of folk have even tried to do away with the definition of sin. They say, okay, well, you, you know that the word says that the, the wages of sin is death. But, but they don't tell you that sin is the transgression of the law. And, and they won't tell you that God's law is still in effect. And they'll say, oh, that was done away with. And, and we are living under mercy and grace. Thank God for mercy and grace. Because it was mercy and grace that kept Adam and Eve alive in the Garden of Eden. That ain't no new thing. It was mercy and grace that kept Lucifer. When he got big and bold enough, wake Chris up back there. When he got big and bold enough to rebel against God, God had three options. He had three options. He could have destroyed him right there. He didn't have to cast him out. He could have just done away with him right there. That was his first option. His second option could have been just to turn his head and act like nothing ever happened. His third option was to let him show who he really was and deal with him at the end. God chose the third option and it was mercy and grace that made him choose that. <sighs> the Lord desires the mind to be renovated and the heart to be filled with the treasure of truth. Truth has power. Truth has power. 
we got people in high places even now that are going to find out and they're in the process of finding out that truth has power. My mother often told me that a lie will go around the world by the time truth gets up and put his pants on. And slow as truth might be, truth is going to be revealed. Amen. Amen. Y'all might fool folk and fool me and live all kinds of lies and all of that, but the truth is going to come out. Thank you, Jesus. Truth has power to elevate the receiver. It, it has a sanctifying influence upon the mind and the character. That's, that's what truth does. Truth sanctifies us. Truth sets us apart. You, you know, we, we, we talk about, boy, I, I want to be sanctified. And, 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 and then the devil even took uh, that word sanctification and, and he tried to give his own definition of it. And he got folk thinking that to be sanctified means that you do the holy dance and that you speak in certain tongues and that you do all of those things. That's not sanctification. Sanctification is to be set aside. For a holy purpose. Amen. And that's what truth does for you. And if we are truly the people of God, we are sanctified by the truth. We have been set aside. It's something different about us and the world. We don't blend in with the world. But we are in contrast to the world. A Christian should possess more. Get this now. Y'all might want to write this down. A Christian should possess more intelligence and keener discernment than the world. Say that again. I'm gonna say it again now. You can, I'm gonna say it slow so you can write this down. A Christian should possess more intelligence and keener discernment than the world. And if you are a child of God and you're striving to be all that God wants you to be. It's true in your case. You might not recognize it and realize it, but it's true. You see, what the enemy has done is created for us artificial <laughs> intelligence. Amen. Artificial intelligence. Y you know what artificial means? It means that it's not real. It's not real. So the devil says, well, you know, the world is intelligent. We got men flying all in space. We've got all kinds of scientific developments and we got all kinds of theologians and all of the wonderful things and thoughts that they come up with and all of that. But unless you're God's child, you realize that all of that is artificial. And the only true intelligence, what did Jesus, what did, what did the word of God say? If you lack wisdom, ask him. Ask who? Ask God. He is the source of all wisdom, all knowledge, all understanding that is real. But the devil has his counterfeit. And the devil will have you thinking that you're doing all of this and all of that. But it's just something that's going to fade away. It's 
not everlasting, but God's intelligence is everlasting. God's word is continually expanding your mind and strengthening and, and, and you and your intellect. There is nothing that will refine and elevate the character and give vigor to every faculty as the continual exercise of the mind and grasp of spiritual truth. The human mind begins to shrink and it becomes enfeebled when we begin to major in dealing with commonplace things. When we allow commonplace things to take the predominance over our intellectual walk with God, our mind begins to shrink. Oh, now you got some smart folk out there. I mean, you got some brilliant minds out there. But in God's sight, their minds have shrunk. Because instead of dwelling on spiritual things, they are now focusing on worldly things. And the devil is very crafty. He'll have you thinking that you're doing God's will and you're really doing the devil's will. God expects us to cultivate our minds and our hearts so that his will can be done in our lives. When Paul penned these words in Romans 12, verse 2, he said, Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. God here is mandating that his people will use the talents and the power he has given us to develop characters that glorify him. It's all about your character. The transformation that Paul is referring to is not just you start thinking one way and you start thinking another way. It's easy to think that, but it's more than that. What Paul is challenging the people of God to do is to develop new characters, set aside the evil old man, and become new creatures, new characters in Christ. There are some biblical examples, and then I'm going to sit down. There are some biblical examples of people that were transformed. You, you remember those uh, 11 guys. It, it started out with 12, but it wound up with being 11. You remember those 11 guys that we call the disciples, right? They came from all different walks of life, and they were fishermen, and one was a tax collector and you know they, they had all kinds of occupations and walks in life but when they met Jesus they not only believed that he was the Messiah but their encounter with Jesus began to transform their minds and it didn't stop with their minds, but they began to develop the character. In, in, in other words, Jesus for three and a half years worked on their characters. He worked on their characters. And, and, and can you imagine that those guys, some of them rough, rough fishermen and like sailors and cussers and all of those kinds of things. They came to Jesus, and when Jesus said, follow me, they followed Jesus. And when they followed Jesus, there was a transformation that was taking place step by step, day by day, week by week, month by month, that they were in the presence of Jesus. I 
imagine they could all say, can you imagine me? I used to be rough. But now here I am turning my cheek. Here I am going from place to place, not even knowing what I'm going to get to when I get there. But simply because a man named Jesus said, go. There was another individual. She was a Samaritan woman, and she met Jesus at the well one day, Jacob's well. She was there at the oddest time of the day. Because it, it, it really wasn't common for people to go during the, the midday or the noon hour. But there she was because she didn't want to be around the other folk and be ridiculed because everybody knew her business. Amen. Yeah, they, 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 they were like some of y'all. You know, everybody's business. You can't handle your own. Amen. Uh, the one group says, sweep around your own way. I know before you try to sweep around mine. And, and so she was trying to avoid those folk. And when she went there, you know, you could be running from some folk and then run right straight into Jesus. <laughs> and she ran into Jesus down at the well. And Jesus told her everything there was to know about her life. And, 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 and then Jesus said, uh, uh, give me some water. And she said, you don't have nothing to draw your water with. And, 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 and he said, woman, if you only knew who I was, you would be asking me for water because I will give you water that you will never thirst again. Jesus changed her life right there on the spot and he told her about all the men that she had had in her life and how that even though she had been with them, he gave her an opportunity to be the first evangelist for the gospel of Jesus Christ. She went running back and told everybody, come see this man. He told me everything there was to know about my life. Bible says that the whole town was saved, was converted because of her witness. And you know something? I thank God that even though some folk know about your past, God can still use you. Because he didn't send her to another neighborhood or another town. Uh, she went right back to where she came from. And she called everybody there and said, come see this man. And, 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 and this man changed not only her life, but everybody's life that came from that town. The devil tried to make you feel like, okay, I used to do drugs or I used to drink and I, I used to hoe monger and I used to hop, be a, a, a bed hopper or, or I used to be a church hopper or whatever, that God can't use you. But when you allow the Holy Ghost to transform your mind, transform your character, God can and God will use you. And I thank God he's no respect to a person, and, and I still take issue with those folk that feel like you got to have two, two you, trying to find a nice way to say it that you got to be a man in order to do God's work I heard a preacher last night and, and he was doing a good message and then he went down the wrong road with me because it didn't line up with the word of God and he was trying to justify their denomination's belief that women should not minister and, 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 and he was talking about how the Levites were were all ordained, but they were ordained to do different things, and only the, 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 the family of Aaron were chosen to be priests. Now, that answers the question for a lot, but it doesn't answer the question about who laid hands on Jesus. It doesn't answer the question about who laid hands on Melchizedek. You see, in other words, we don't put so much on, uh, emphasis on, on, well, this priest got to, what, what doesn't happen to the priesthood anyway? 
we, we just got one priest now. So why are we all still trying to be priests of man's definition? We got one priest, one high priest, and his name is Jesus. And Jesus uses anybody, use a mule, will use a rock if y'all too stubborn. God's not limited. We are the ones that have limitations. God is not limited. And this woman said, can you imagine me? Even with the past I have, even with the things that I've done and still doing, that this man took time to talk to me and I was transformed right there at Jacob's well. Oh, but she wasn't the only one. You remember how Paul, who was then Saul, <laughs> oh, he, he, he was on fire. He was on fire. He had a zeal and a zest. But it was to do the devil's work. He was going around persecuting the people of God. He was going around locking them up, and he was stood by to see uh, some, many of God's chosen servants be stoned and killed. He was right there in the midst. But oh, when he went through his metamorphosis on a road called Damascus, and the Lord revealed himself in the light to Paul, to Saul, and he changed his name to Paul. He realized that the power of God can transform anybody. Because Saul Intelligent, noble, respected person. But then this same individual that was crucified, the people of God, had to then go back and teach the same gospel. <laughs> and notice now, Jesus didn't change the gospel to fit Paul. Jesus changed Paul to fit the gospel. That's what God is trying to do with each one of us. He's trying to change us, to line us up with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I wonder if your heart is willing. I got one more person and then I'm going to sit down. There was another woman I want to talk about. And she's found over in John, the 8th chapter, verses 1 through 11. She had been a prostitute. In other words, she had illicit relationships with people that she was not, was not married to. She slept. She gave her body to men that she was not married to. then they got the notion, okay, here comes this man, Jesus. Let's see what he gonna do about this woman. The very ones now that were sleeping with her. The, the very ones that were taking advantage of her goodies. That's right. Let's say, let's take her over here to Jesus and see what he's gonna he say he the Messiah. Let me, I'm just going to see if he, how he going to deal with this situation. You know, and the devil will do you like that. He'll get your mind all messed up. He'll get you to thinking that, you know, he's your best friend and that he's the goodest thing for you. I know that's not proper. He's the goodest thing for you. And then he will hang you out to dry. He'll pull the cover back and reveal and expose. Notice that he exposes everybody but himself. 
He does. He, he stays behind the scenes, and he, 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 he makes sure that all the blame and all the mess and everything is pointed at somebody else instead of him. And these men came, and they brought this woman to Jesus. In fact, they say she has been caught in adultery. It wasn't, no, uh, it wasn't one of those situations, well, did you get a video of me? Uh, it, it wasn't me. It, it wasn't no denying the fact because they caught her right there in the act. It might have been somebody that was mad with her because they had wanted to be with her that night, but instead she was with somebody. You know how folk will hate on you now. You know how folk will hate on you and they'll set you up and plot because, you know, they want something that you didn't give them. Yeah. Yeah. brought her to Jesus and said, Jesus, we have caught this woman in the very act of adultery. What you going to do about it? And see, that's why I, I thank God for godly intelligence and wisdom and discernment and not inter, uh, artificial intelligence. Because artificial intelligence said, well, yeah, we, well, the, the law says that we need to stone her to death. That's what the law requires that she be stoned to death. But Jesus, in his godly wisdom, simply knelt down and began to write in the sand. The Bible doesn't tell us what he wrote. So anybody that tells you what he wrote is just conjecture on their part. But I do find it interesting that the more he wrote, the less they stood around. They began to get out of Dodge. He wrote some and then one would just walk on. He wrote some more and then one or two more would just write, write, walk on. These were her accusers that when Jesus got through writing in the sand, he looked up and all of her accusers were gone. Now, that's not the point, though. Jesus wasn't through. He looked at that woman and he said, where are your accusers? And she said, they're gone. And he looked at her and he said, now you go and sin no more. And I, 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 I just believe that that woman said, can you imagine me, a known prostitute, have made my living selling my body. And now here I am forgiven by God. Can you imagine me being forgiven? But she ain't the only one. You see, she's got some representative right here now. Right here in this sanctuary right now. The devil done brought you to God. And said, I know and I remember and I even saw and I witnessed when they did this and when they did that. And how they lied and how they cheated and how they did all kinds of things. What you going to do, God? And Jesus just said, wait a minute. I got some writing I'm doing. He ain't writing and saying now. I'm going to tell you that now. He, he ain't writing and saying. He's writing in a book. writing in a book called the book of life and, and he said wait a minute I, I, I know 
that the accuser is telling the truth because they did used to do drugs and they did used to sell drugs and they did used to hold mongle and they did used to steal and lie and do all of those cheating things and everything. They did every they did it all. But wait a minute. I, I'm doing some writing right here. And by my blood, oh, oh Father, by my blood, I, I have just written their name in the book of life. And I don't know about you, but I'm going like, imagine me. Because what the devil was saying was true. you really know that God has forgiven you. God has forgiven you. As we follow that woman's story, we find that she not only went in didn't sin anymore, but she began to follow Jesus. In fact, usually where you saw Jesus, you didn't only see the disciples, but she was there too. Because she couldn't get enough of being around Jesus. Can you imagine what it means to be changed by God. You see, if you continue to read Romans 12, and you go down to around the ninth and 10th verse, this is the litmus test to help us to understand if we've really been changed, if we've metamorphed, if we've been transformed, by the renewing of our mind. Verse 9 says, let love be without dissemination. Somebody might say, well, oh, that's a big word. I don't know what dissemination means. It comes from the Greek word that simply means let your love be sincere without hypocrisy. Don't tell me to your face that you love me and then behind my back you act like you hate me. Let your love be without dissemination. That's one way that you can tell that you have been transformed. That you have metamorphed into what God would have you to be. Another thing is that you abhor that which is evil. In other words, you despise evil things, wickedness. You get to the point where you just can't stand unrighteousness. It, it, it becomes distasteful to you and you don't long for it. You long to be without it. This part puzzled me for a moment when I read it, and it says, cleave to that which is good. Now, when you, that word cleave comes from the same root word where we get the word cleaver. And a cleaver is like a knife, which is used to cut. So, Lord, what are you saying about, what, it doesn't make sense, cut to that which is good. But then again, as I prayed and the Holy Ghost talked to me a little bit more, he helped me to understand that in order to draw nigh to that which is good, you got to cut some stuff out of your life that is not good. Got to let it go. 
Cut it out. See, too many of us try to make it into the kingdom of God, but we're holding on to the world at the same time. We've got to make up our mind that we're going to cut the world off and walk with God. Then verse 10 brings it all together. When it says, be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring to be with baby sister in honor preferring to be with Joshua preferring to be with Sister Smith Tanya Joshua Grandma we prefer to be with each other When you get to the point where you would prefer to be with the body rather than to be away from the body, you have been transformed. Imagine that. Help us, Lord, to walk in our trans-